Hi everyone. I would like to say good morning, but it's already noon. So hi everyone. It's noon, and I'm glad to see so many faces here because the last time and Stephen doesn't give me to lie here. Last time I gave this talk at Flock last year, we were happy four people in the same room. Uh, a video operator to people who came to listen to the talk and I'm presenting there, which was nice because in parallel there was Korea's uh, talk, everybody went there. That's perfect because people love new technologies and it's great to have them there. But I'm talking about old technologies and actually we have 40 years anniversary of these old technologies. So all the uh, functions that we use for granted, get PWNAM and get group stuff, came in 1979, right? And that's amazing. We use something that was designed 40 years ago and it's still in use in production all around the world and basically we don't know how to get rid of it. <laughs> but unfortunately with any old technology comes a nice thing called off by one error because it's 41 year this year, not 40. Um, and really all those APIs, if you look at them, <clears throat> I come back here, um, so name service switch, which kind of abstracted the, uh, the way of, of using it, came in 93. So the um, authentication APIs abstraction came at, at the end of 90s. So we really talk about stuff that, that really is not from this century. It's maybe even out of this world. And kind of last ABIs, APIs made in in 90s, that's what we deal with all the time. And those who were um, or familiar with Finland history, this is the stuff that Finnish um, students are doing every year uh, upon graduation or before they get to the uh, matriculation exams. They all jump on those tracks via the, uh, this kind of funny stuff that they can find, uh, draw these posters and ride across their towns, throwing candies. And there are people trying to pick up these candies. In Helsinki, for example, this takes something like two hours because there are many uh, colleges and every one of them is at least two or three trucks like this. So it's, it's a fun and these were really the last students made in, in the 90s, so 1999 and 2000 and they, they ended like when it was two, three years ago. That was my um, elder daughter's uh, kind of graduation thing. But really, if we look into it, the, uh, the evolution was really slow. So it, there was kind of a, f a bit of um, fast uh, evolution in 80s, a bit of um, aggressive uh, transition to uh, simplification of those technologies in 90s, but since 2000, there's a bit of stagnation. So we reuse the uh, protocols, we reuse technologies on the system level that <laughs> proven to be working, and it proves to be hard to change that and uh, agree on something that applies on the, again on the system level, while at the same time on the um, on the application level, there is a huge diversity in approaches. The web basically changed everything. Web 2.0, all this semantic stuff that got replaced by uh, REST APIs and so on. And we got into interesting situations. So in 90s and, and early 2000s, we got a bunch of projects that implement the system level thing for remote accessing something like LDAP protocol. So there were a bunch of um, projects implementing how you query POSIX data from LDAP, how you plug it into your system, how you use Kerberos. There were two pump KRB5 implementations at the same time, right? There was a smart card handling with pump PKCS11. Um, to every big system and you know, server side provider 
deemed to introduce their own NSS and PAM stack modules. So it was flowering uh, there. But with this variety of implementations of kind of standard API, uh, we got where it is. Yeah, we got to um, a typical, let's say, Linux distribution that has a bunch of these modules. So uh, this is Fedora, like two releases, three releases before, right? We have uh, SSSD provided libnssss. Then we have a bunch of modules inside Gripc, the standard ones. We have Samba providing its windbind connector. We have libnsss LDAP from NSS Palm LDAP and or an LCD projects uh, that give access to LDAP stuff. And on the Palm stack, we also have those those modules. Um, the um, uh, problem here is that it works for single machine and it works kind of nicely but if you need to deploy configurations of this to a fleet of thousand servers thousands servers or worse than that uh, workstations which might be bringing bring out stuff in, in your office you you will have to deal with the um, inevitable configuration changes that happen on a particular machine, especially if there's somebody root other than you, like on the work, uh, workstations. Uh, you need to add complexity of the uh, local configuration tweaks, because if, if this is workstation, then most likely I'm, I'm wanting to use it against my home network, as well as uh, corporate network, as well as like with Fedora, I have Fedora um, I, accounts, right, which also require certain handling because Fedora provides the Kerberos authentication to access some of its endpoints and so on. So we got also requirements uh, for the universal access for user and group data beyond POSIX. So POSIX API, for example, for retrieving user information, never in 40 years had any kind of field for email address. For new generations, emails <laughs> becoming something that they might start asking what it is because they, they moved on to stuff like WhatsApp and, and uh, social networks and maybe don't have any email at all. But in 40 years that email mattered, it did not exist in the POSIX API. So the first thing you do when you connect your web applications, you use some sort of identifier, and that identifier needs to come, uh, needs to be some, something unique. Many applications were using uh, email addresses for that because that allows you to also get back the uh, notifications to the user over the uh, channel that at least a bit predictable in what it is. And if you map on the same database that contains your corporate users or your Fedora uh, contributors users, you don't get through the same POSIX API access to email address, as basic as that. So there are uh, requirements that might look contemporary, uh, but really they, they are not fulfilled by anything. And so another example is HomeD which is uh, a project from uh, Systemd, uh, family of projects where they try to store much more information about the user, like uh, user-related uh, keys that would be used to encrypt, to, to create encryption of the home directory and some additional details about it, which cannot be resolved through the uh, traditional POSIX API for identity management. But on the other side, with this variety of uh, implementations, we get a lot of uh, issues, and those issues are typical. So we get a bunch of modules. These modules need somehow be configured, but they also uh, were written uh, with often with the concept of not taking into account that they are loaded directly in the application, and therefore their state actually is capable to 
see what's happening in the application and not the same side applic application itself can see the state of that module so if your module for example loads uh, credentials needed to access some remote uh, database like LDAP binds the application technically can look up into what is loaded into it itself via uh, glibc NSS modules and pick up those credentials which it's supposed not to have access at all. So there were uh, approaches uh, to have uh, privilege separation, talking small schemes over the uh, uh, Unix domain sockets to a daemon that runs in background. That's effectively how SSSD works or how um, Windbind works or how uh, NLCD and uh, NSS panel that D work, so they all have kind of a separate daemon. But um, many of those don't have, like PAM CareB5 doesn't have it. Uh, you need to load all this stuff in your application, and sometimes you might have libraries also loaded with this that clash with the libraries that you're supposed to use in the application. ABI problems are real, and they, they do exist and happen. But the other part is many of these modules over 20 some fish years um, became broken, uh, ab abandoned in the upstreams, completely removed. The, their owners might, or, or the people who developed them might switch to a different topic, which is perfectly okay, that's their life. And from the distribution point of view, this is probably the worst thing. You're, you're becoming the one who maintains it. So streamlining this kind of uh, stack of, of tumbleweed becomes an interesting thing, <clears throat> especially if you need to support this for 10 years or even longer. And uh, also, a fanciness weird out. 40 years is uh, a different fashion now, right? It, it is something that many um, students or used to be students <coughs> graduating and going to work, they look mostly at the uh, mobile world and see potential there, not working with this boring uh, protocol uh, stuff that might have no future from their point of view. Again, it served us well. We just faced the real problem of, um, of struggling with, with real maintenance uh, problem for various reasons. So life may be easy on the web side because there is some rest and, and there is a stress here. Um, the funny part is that I think it was two years ago that the, uh, we celebrated a decade of SSSD in Fedora. <clears throat> so Fedora Core 11 was 2008, 2009. So yeah, a, a decade of, of that passed so fast. We gained a lot of functionality, gained a lot of uh, support for a lot of things. It's now uh, one of the uh, pieces of the client side um, that, that exist everywhere, almost in all distributions. It's packaged and assumed to be uh, used. There are some things that are kind of debatable, but that's okay. We, we go forward and uh, improve through debates <coughs> here, right? So on the other side, <coughs> if we look at all this stuff, then uh, Fedora is actually quite conservative. The, uh, if you look at RHEL 7 and RHEL 8 development, RHEL 8 actively deprecated a bunch of the modules that are still available in Fedora because there is a voice of customer in Fedora asking to keep it and maybe there are people who are willing to maintain it unlike on, on the Red Hat Enterprise Linux side where maintainers choose where the battles are and for some of these things, it's, it's better to focus on something else. So, for example, the Pumpcare B5 was removed from RHEL 8. And as I say, there are two Pumpcare B5s. One of them was dead, um, well, maybe five years ago. As soon as Red Hat removed Pumpcare B5 from its 
uh, soon to be at that point rail 8 um, and publish it better in three months after that the original author of the, the presumed dead Pankir B5 in Debian uh, restored its work. I don't know what was the reason that he started doing this again, but he started doing so. Now we got the, the dead module restored. Uh, undead or zombie, I don't know. <clears throat> we all zombies. We walk for years. Um, the same was with one of the PKCS 11 things, but um, here, the, the progress was quite, uh, quite big uh, on the um, uh, smart cards infrastructure side. I, I'll get back to that part, uh, thanks to our colleagues and um, Jakob Bielinek and the others on the unification of the smart card access. And um, so all of these, this functionality is not lost. It's all provided through SSSD. Same in Fedora just that we have options. <clears throat> um, but on the other side, configuration of those options happens in, I would say there's a varying success uh, failure rate. And sometimes something very simple uh, might, might be looking innocent to the uh, package, change, uh, package maintainer that changes it and causing, causing the problem. So for example, look at this. The uh, auth config thing existed since 1999. So for quite a long time. The auth config has standard, standard thing. The, um, if, if package provides a module, for example, this fingerprint, this is the real bug from Fedora um, three years ago, I think. Um, the module installs its own stuff and updates the uh, uh, configuration. And when you remove the module, it's supposed to remove itself, otherwise it will be some, uh, something would be referenced in the PAM configuration that does not exist, which might not be pleasantly <laughs> uh, you know, usable for, for the PAM stack itself, and it might just fail to allow you login. This is exactly what the bug made with it, uh, unconditional removal, uh, disabling of the fingerprint was causing the problem with the um, removal because uh, update doesn't have, uh, the auth config doesn't have the state of what, what the other options were there. You, you call update and it wipes out the configuration from what was there. In simple cases it works. In more complex ones, when you have windbind or you have a SSD or something, it's not there. So at some point, um, auth config was also needed to be re uh, rewritten from Python 2 to Python 3. Fi uh, that kind of migration uh, needed to happen because Fedora moved us. Yeah, Thomas. I, I, I know, I know. <laughs> it was a sad story in, 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 the, in all of this. And um, effectively, the decision was made, let's, let's do the whole refactoring of this space with a new tool. A new tool was created, and yeah, it, it, it caused uh, some gripes uh, around it, um, but we sort of simplified things um, among the configuration things, but didn't do really um, the actual set up of the things that get configured. So if you set up your pump stack to use SSSD, it doesn't mean that SSSD is configured. That's for some, something else. So for example, uh, where is it? Let me get, yeah, get back here. Uh, all select sets the NSS uh, configuration to the predefined one, PAM to predefined one, but something else should create SSSD or Samba configuration to, to use it. <coughs> And uh, that's done with the, uh, let's say, IPA client install or Realm join, depending on the target there. And finally, Ansible roles that, that create something and become kind of ubiquitous nowadays. So with all these on the single host, you kind of get more or less predictable scenarios, predictable configurations. You can extend them if you want, but for the majority of people, this is not needed. And it allows you to reduce the scope of 
of maintenance and support. Because if the tool knows about the um, basic you know, configuration and ha handles it well, it, it allows to move, move away from the configuration itself into, let's say, SSSD in this case, all the other steps, like handling all this configuration for the certificates and eventually move them centralized like <coughs> IPA does or AD. On the authentication part, the great, the, the, this was a big uh, advancement over the previous state by effectively having a, a unified view onto what, what is the um, smart cards and certificates in, in the system and how they can be used uh, effectively to P11 kit in almost all cases except NUPG. Whatever is above is using P11 kit, one way or another. Which means that you can do nice things like specify the um, very simple uh, URI. I think it came in around 2015, this, this specification for the URI was implemented in a year after that. Uh, that allows you to just say, okay, I have a smart card with this token in it, and if I specify this URI, or I have tools that actually point me to this URI, I don't need to handle all the configuration, all the, all the things, it, it magically appears and works. So nowadays it works in almost everywhere. <coughs> we have fairly good stuff. But on the Kerberos side, uh, there was also progress. This is not Kerberos, right? This is not a three-headed uh, three dog that, that you expect, but it, it probably lo looks like scary stuff that, of, of those owls attacking you when you try to actually configure and use Kerberos like I saw on the many mailing lists. We, we also dealt with the content of <coughs> How many? 30, 35 years history of decisions made 30, 35 years ago, especially around the um, uh, DNS, in using DNS for the resolution, specific uh, encryption types that were their uh, inability to operate in multiple realms environment where you have multiple providers uh, sources of, of the truth of your authentication data, which is, for example, very simple. I have free APA at home, I have free APA at Fedora. Those are two different accounts. One of them I'm using to log into to my system, another one I'm using to log into Fedora uh, things when I do commit for my packages. And then I have a third free, free APA at Red Hat at work, where I used to access all the services in, in Red Hat. So, kind of, I have three of them. They are different. They do not trust each other, and that's good, right? But I want to have access to all of them at the same time, because <laughs> here I'm logging in into the machine. Then I'm building a package, and building a package for Fedora might be actually part of my work uh, during the day. And also accessing the Red Hat resources also might be there. So I need to have some sort of a common access at the same time. And depending on where, where I'm trying to authenticate, that proper credentials should be taken care of. And um, this, this work, the, this problem was known for years. And it, there was an attempt to solve it in Kerberos with um, so-called directory credential uh, caches then uh, trying to increase security of that with the kernel key ring based C caches. All of them had their own uh, limitations. Um, finally, when it was, I think, again, 10 years ago or so, Heimdall introduced the um, uh, Kerberos Credential uh, Manager protocol and um, it was picked up by the um, um, MIT Kerberos by 1.13 version, again, six, seven years ago. But 
that's the client side. The server side was really never implemented well until uh, we did this work in uh, SSSD to implement the storage and nowadays um, Fedora can use and I think it's configured by default to use the KCM uh, provider from SSSD which can be used uh, independently of uh, using any other features of SSSD. So if you don't need to have LDAP stuff, that's fine. You just use the KCM part for um, accessing <coughs> Fedora um, infrastructure, for example. Uh, and um, since these caches, cache types, they, they exist at, at the same time, yeah, they implement it and you can use them on your kind of Depends on where, where you should use it, um, it becomes quite handy. The only problem we have with, with for example, Kirin is it, it's, it's great, it, it's useful for um, having secure access to them, but it's not namespaced. So you cannot use it in containers. Containers will see the same key rings that. Uh, is in the host system or in other containers if they share the same host ID for that uh, query. There is a work ongoing um, to create namespace for uh, the key rings. Uh, this work is still not complete. The patches were flying last year <coughs> quite a lot. Um, I think that there are basics out there, but for example, file systems, networking file systems do not know how to pick up from the uh, containerized things. And there are some existential problems, how you run these networking file systems, mount them within the containers, how you treat them, how to treat IDs and sco uh, scope them. So uh, KCM allows you to kind of sort this problem because in the end, it's a Unix domain socket towards the client, between the client and Unix domain sockets already namespaceable, so you can separate them naturally already. <coughs> okay, and one thing I wanted to say is that um, aside from normal Fedora use where if you create a new Fedora installation and you don't copy any files, by default Fedora will use KCM in the Kerberos operations, but Fedora Toolbox container actually notices that you, you have access to the uh, KCM and you have some tickets there and automatically pulls it in into the container. So when you're in the container, you will automatically get your Kerberos tickets from the host system. This works on uh, Fedora Core IS, for example, uh, quite nicely, but only in the Fedora Toolbox container or something you built on top of it. Um, so there's uh, something to, to improve. The other problem we had, again, if you have multiple parallel Kerberos installations that don't really talk to each other, don't know, you need to somehow handle the um, uh, DNS resolution of the, of the services. And Kerberos can be made not dependent on um, DNS to the level that uh, everything that works automatically. Uh, but it's really a very boring situation. It's better to have, in, in some cases, better to have the uh, dynamic reflection from the DNS to uh, get the load distributed between different KDCs and uh, get uh, some, some way of saying, hey, this set of hosts belongs to one realm, another set of belongs to the other one. The problem is that it's it's a, a typical deployment of this 30, 40 years old behavioral. So people tend to, for example, use SSH server access using just a host name, not the fully qualified host name. And that doesn't really work well with Kerberos. So there was a method that kind of expanded the uh, host name to, uh, through, through some uh, magic and that method was broken uh, if, if you switched it kind of to always require the fully qualified name for security reasons and whatever um, this kind of canonicalization and then um, this is going 
uh, public with uh, Kirby 5118, uh, but Fedora build of Kerberos has the DNS canonicalization tri-state uh, patch for, I think, a year or two already, and allows to basically be smart. If something is not resolvable, you can fall back to another method, or you disable this behavioral and uh, depend on the um, <coughs> non-fully qualified name or always fully qualified name there, depending on what, what you deal with. This is especially handy if you have, again, multiple realms in parallel and you have one rules in one of them and another rules in the other. Um, it also helps OpenShift basic applications where host names Host names for the containers, uh, they typically are not fully qualified within the container. <clears throat> we have uh, been looking at the other things. Uh, there is a mechanism to proxy access to the Kerberos uh, key distribution centers if even if the client is not really having direct access to them proxy over the HTTPS connection, this KDC proxy. It doesn't work if this uh, KDC proxy information needs to be resolved dynamically through DNS. Currently, it only works via um, explicit configuration. And there are some low-level details why you cannot do the, the discovery of multiple of those at the same time and, and choose one or the other. So the, the work is ongoing, mostly in upstreams, uh, Fedora sort of special here because it gets hammered with the upstream, uh, the, the newest upstream code uh, faster than the other distributions. In this area, that's happened to be uh, probably my and Robbie's fault. Um, so sometimes it's a bitter um, experience. Sometimes we actually get smoother and slicker stuff. On the other hand, um, a lot of work has been done in Kerberos community to finally <coughs> say no for weak crypto and say no for the stuff that is known to be broken. And uh, you cannot really imagine the, the level of opposition from admins that say we have stuff that works, we never touch it, even if the uh, uh, actual system that provides that stuff uh, already unsupported by its vendor. A typical situation is something like Windows Server 2003, which apparently is so, so widespreadly used still by the uh, big organizations uh, for building their forests, active directory forests. <coughs> At the core of the forest, they keep the oldest thing and up, 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 never update it, or update it or something really conservative. The, the key with 2003 server is that it doesn't support any new uh, crypto, so it requires DES3 and, um, and DES, a uh, single DES was used for uh, NT hashes in the Windows NT networks where the password was stored, so it's, it's inherited from that. So there was uh, finally an attempt a couple of years ago to build up request for comments for removing both of those from Kerberos, making it last, last notice. And uh, Kerby 518 removes completely the, this support. <clears throat> but on the other side, we have uh, system-wide crypto policies which allow us to force applications to not use those, those, those protocols, but again, if, if the uh, support for the uh, crypto primitives exists in the crypto library, somebody can, can try to use them outside. So we're removing it completely. Except the um, RC4, um, which is market deprecated, but it's used within the SMB protocol and within the Active Directory in a couple of places where you cannot get away. So there's a work ongoing to fix that. <coughs> but I will talk about this a bit later. So the other part is um, introduction of uh, crypto based on relatively recent 
research as in like 20 years and 10, 20 to 10 years, let's say this way. So so-called SPAC pre-authentication implemented now in, in Kerberos uh, for quite maybe four, three, four years and enabled by default in uh, Fedora. This has a, a good feature that your passwords cannot really be uh, um, attacked uh, over the uh, internet. So Kerberos originally was created as a way to work over the insecure networks, but it didn't have a mechanism to prevent <coughs> impersonation. And one of those mechanisms was uh, to, to have encrypted timestamp, but you still had a window of opportunity to, to get there. So Spake closes this window of opportunity for the attack, and if you disable all these older methods, uh, we don't disable them by default yet. But if you disable those old, old methods and your, all your clients support Spake, like all recent figures, uh, you prevent the dictionary type attacks on, on your infrastructure through the Kerberos quite um, seriously. Uh, the other part is that you could have uh, a mechanism that says Okay, um, I used smart card or I used multi-factor authentication to obtain this ticket and you can use this information from the ticket at the server which you try to access to say you cannot access this service if you don't have, for example, multi-factor or smart card uh, obtained ticket. So something <coughs> like using a password is not enough to, to obtain it, you really have to raise your security to access resources. Uh, FreeAPA implements this through so-called authentication indicators and you can associate the service with an indicator and then application that runs this service will never see requests from anything but users that actually fulfill this because it will be stopped at the moment where a ticket needs to be issued by the key distribution center. There are yeah, policies now that allow you to handle a bit, but we are, it, it's becoming a bit wobbly because we are still in the process of defining what you could do, how you can reassign certain properties of the uh, ticket that is being issued by KDC according to how you pre-authenticate it. If you got something like uh, OTP, which is uh, multi-factor authentication, uh, ticket, then we, you might have some sort of extension of a, a lifetime of the ticket, so it could, could could live longer or be renew it for longer time, or maybe the other way around. It's really a policy for the administrators to define. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, what is what hardened? Yeah. yeah. The question is, what is hardened here? So it's. It's a uh, spake based authentication and uh, timestamp encrypted authentication. Either of those basically use a pre-authentication with password in both cases. Just, uh, and we define as hardened. Uh, just because uh, it is not clear password uh, based negotiation. Uh, we use some pre-authentication. Think about it that pre-authentication at least happened before we actually authenticate. <coughs> On the uh, edge side, uh, we have uh, Kerberos 1.18, which hopefully will land in Fedora 32, or in Rawhide before branch it. We kind of uh, working currently on the breakage on ABI level between different things. Uh, we get, um, ability to look up into the content of some structures in the ticket before the ticket is issued. And so the free APA driver on the KDC side can actually modify certain things, insert or remove or deny uh, with a greater flexibility than before, which allows us to say to um, Microsoft systems, the Microsoft Windows systems, that this user who used PKI init 
to authenticate with the smart card on Linux machine actually is the smart card authenticated user and the Windows will recognize that and will do certain things uh, it does for smart card authenticated users. Not implemented yet, but this is where we are going on the both direction so that you kind of get fine-tuned uh, settings. So for example, uh, one thing you could do is to add to this MSPAC structure uh, an information saying that this user has a higher level access, uh, security level access by setting a special well-known security identifier that says this user is not really accessing as the lowest privileged one, but can get access to the files that protected with uh, some higher, high security labels on the file systems. <clears throat> we were not able to do that before. We would be able to do that with Kerberos 118. Um, 118 also introduces the resource-based constraint delegation support, which existed in um, Windows for quite some time. Well, finally completes this. It's a bit complex topic, but it allows you to close down um, decision making on who can access what uh, across multiple trusted realms uh, with, with certain things. Who can impersonate whom uh, in, in that presentation and use the credentials of, um, or ticket obtained from that in the other things. Um, also, Kerberos 118 merged interesting uh, module uh, called the Nego X, which is really like a, a shell where, where you put something working in it. Microsoft put uh, so-called uh, PKU2U uh, thing, which allows it to do peer-to-peer -peer authentication for the machines that do not belong to the same domain while at the same time proving identity of a user by binding it to online identity. Like your um, open ID connect identity. So going outside of, of the old technologies and maybe allowing us to, to get some nicer path forward with the new and fancy stuff. Don't know how it was work, but how this will work out, but uh, there, there is a possibility at least now with the infrastructure. Um, one thing we were looking for SPAC is to actually handle long-standing problems of um, multi-factor authentication where you need to have some secure channel between the client and the server to pass <coughs> the token for validation uh, on, on the Kerberos side and the work for the base of, of this passing is sort of in place. It needs RFC to exp explain the multi-factor part of what is put into the SPAC uh, exchange and then implementation, but this is already getting, getting to, um, to the horizon, let's say this for you. So. And on a longer term work, um, yeah, having the um, support for all these fancy new tokens, the uh, web auth and um, thing for Kerberos. Uh, it needs a lot of specification first, understanding how this web-based exchange and, and proof of uh, access uh, and authentication can be mapped into essentially non-interactive, non-browser thing then how it mapped into particular uh, identities, again, identity management, where the token itself might be issued by absolutely different party. You, if you're buying this uh, YubiKey, for example, or any, anything other, it has nothing to, it has kind of a, inside it um, a certificate with authority that has nothing to do with you or your organization and you need to allow mapping that to, to your accounts and treat it somehow. So this is not written even, uh, specified somehow, lest implemented. <coughs> okay, so there are dragons and one of the bigger kind of 
things that happened in divergence between um, Fedora and RHEL was that in RHEL, uh, Open LDAP server was removed because Red Hat meant that really there are better ways to support customers with Open LDAP using Open LDAP community or um, partnership there. Uh, on top of RHEL, apparently, there are so many customers of those companies that actually run RHEL, uh, but the support better comes from people who actually develop Open LDAP. <clears throat> but in, uh, in Fedora, we have on this, at this time, like four alternatives for the directory, LDAP-based directories. Uh, one of them is, uh, two of them are folding into kind of one, but with different purpose. So 389D as server, as a generic LDAP server. Free APA as an implementation of a particular view on the directory and identity problem set. Then Samba AD, uh, which tries to implement uh, AD compatibility, and Open LDAP. <coughs> and 389DS does a great, uh, 389DS project does a great job on introducing the uh, visual uh, handling and tuning of the uh, uh, server, it's, it's all available in Fedora and it's really, really making the experience of using um, directory server and seeing what's behind the bonnet is uh, much easier. There, there is also a command line tooling, but integration with cockpit is, is kind of interesting and I would recommend if you look at this, even with free APA, you might want to look into the cockpit plugin. On the free APA side, we complemented work done for the um, Kerberos by removing some defaults, setting uh, aggressive defaults for uh, FIPS mode, uh, trying to um, follow the um, system-wide crypto policies. Not everywhere, it's still work in progress, but we are going there. And with um, Fedora 31, we actually got uh, a first step of our free APA Samba integration uh, in, in place. So you now can have uh, a Samba file server running on IPA master in a supported, uh, on IPA client enrolled into a free APA environment in a supported uh, shape. Before that, it was like a, a bit of uh, hacking here and there. Still there are things to be fixed, to, to be uh, uh, produced, but we also forced to use Kerberos only here. So we closed down the uh, uh, password-based authentication, for example, and uh, try to, to enforce and get better, um, better security there. Um, there are a few things interesting, for example, for Fedora infrastructure folks, like the hidden and unadvertised unadvertise, uh, replicas, which allow you to have something that just used for back, uh, taking backups, but skipping the load from, from the uh, uh, clients that try to authenticate or search for it, they will skip it. And um, the other part is the extended group management. Uh, this is what Rick was talking yesterday in the uh, um, Fedora account system rebirth uh, thing. So I hope we get improvement on this. But this is also useful in other places where you need to grant two-step level kind of uh, access doing the um, group membership by de designated persons rather than the administrators of free IP itself. And yeah, we're working on having um, <coughs> access to Windows machines using IP users. There is some progress there. Uh, we have a prototype that shows that what is possible to do there. You can even manage, uh, be an administrator on the Windows domain controller and manage it all by being IP user. Not the other way around, because that's already supported. And that's a path to actually have IPA to IPA trust, which I hope will be in the next three, something like three Fedora releases, hopefully. And the final part here is 
improvements and getting the defaults higher, better in the certificate management, give more configuration options if you set up new integrated certificate authority, support IP addresses and certificates, that's I think OpenStack often uh, requested. And we have a bunch of utilities now that reuse the same infrastructure for all three big parts. So IPA health check does something like 300 different checks on the machine to verify that something is good or wrong uh, and warn you about it. It doesn't provide remediation yet. Hopefully at some point we, we look at what to do with it. But the same for specific for the directory server and for the uh, doc tag, for the certificate authority. And um, there is a work in progress. It's not yet in Fedora. Um, on the um, doc tag side to implement a local ACME service so that you can ask over ACME protocol for IPA uh, backed uh, certificates regularly. Uh, same way as you do with Let's Encrypt and others. <clears throat> not yet in Fedora. I, I wonder why they haven't yet cut the release um, for that. There's a sizable Ansible integration, uh, a plug. In a, in a 40 minutes, there will be a talk about it. Go to DO206, which is actually the next room where the whole security track will take on. And listen there. Actually, there will be live live video, uh, live demo, not video uh, there. And finally, Samba um, disabled SMB1 by default. We got a lot of bug reports, but what we can do, we have to remove SMB1 simply because it's insecure and it's, it should be gone. The, the only problem, we do not have implementation of the POSIX semantics on top of a newer protocol. There is a work ongoing, hopefully by end of this year, there will be something upstream that, that we can do. The, the work ongoing is happening in a collaboration between uh, Samba upstream and Microsoft, which is willing to put this into specification as an official specification, not extension, but part of the specification, and actually, uh, putting the bill for uh, client-side implementation of that in Linux. So, Stephen French and uh, another developer who works on this, on the Linux kernel Sips module, they, they actually work at uh, Microsoft on that. And yeah, we, we are getting a lot of uh, improvements, but many of them are not visible to users. They may be important to administrators. There is some uh, improvement work on the uh, using Active Directory uh, implementation in Samba with MIT Kerberos. It's not done yet. We're still blocked by some fundamental pieces not implemented and, um, and the lack of time, which I guess is my problem right now. Right? I have two minutes. Thank you. And if you have questions, please.